Hello all, my name is AJ Kluth and I'm pleased to present here some ongoing research that's part of a larger project considering connections between contemporary spaces of musical experimentalism in Los Angeles. This one in particular concerns a concert series that has been interrupted by the recent pandemic. It's looking like programming will continue this summer, but for the time being, this work considers events up until spring of 2020. My interest in Jazz is Dead began, began sometime in 2017 when I started seeing the posters pasted up on fences, electrical boxes, and alley walls all over Los Angeles. Other than the words Jazz is Dead, there was no further information. Was it for a concert series, a product, a band? After some Googling, I learned it was something like a large umbrella project put together by Adrian Young and Ali Shaheed Mohammed that features uh, related in endeavors, including Young and Mohammed's band, The Midnight Hour, the event agency Art Don't Sleep, the all analog recording studio Linear Labs, and the eponymous concert series and soon to be record imprint. I've been interested in the problematization of the term jazz since I started reading some of the new jazz studies years back, and of course, Nicholas Payton's sometimes controversial, uh, controversial that is, refusal of jazz in favor of black American music or BAM in 2011. Still, I haven't been able to secure an interview with Young and therefore can't be sure for his impulse for the name. In interviews, he's often slippery when asked about it, alluding simply to its provocative nature. His partner, Ali Shaheed Mohammed, a member of a tribe called Quest, a mover in the Silquarian scene, and even endorsed with a signature Fender precision bass, is less often in the limelight, whereas a DJ, composer, producer, multi-instrumentalist, event organizer, and cultural instigator, Young, is more voluble in interviews. His predilection for three-piece suits, hats, fingerless gloves, this all seemed to hearken to late 70s European cinema as much as black exploitation film aesthetics. And this can also be heard in the soundtrack music for um, an imaginary Italian film he produced called Venice Dawn, as well as the soundtracks for more tangible projects like Black Dynamite and Marvel's television series, Luke Cage. Early concerts organized by Jazz's Dead partners, Art Don't Sleep, demonstrate an understanding of jazz in name and in concept as a big tent, a constellation of mutually inflecting musics related ahistorically in a mutually constituting loop. This broad definition of jazz has helped occasion a community of listenership in Los Angeles that is oriented around black American music, but not monolithic in its constitution. Rather, folks from many positions across fields of power as defined by their class, race, education, access, and exposures to music have been part of this community, coming together in a room in Los Angeles's near east side to enact a living, dancing archive of musical memory. My talk today considers the significance of Jazz is Dead in three chunks. First, in terms of the production of a musical culture bigger than genre. Second, considering this socio-musical history as an intermusical archive that is a condition of possibility for the new. And finally, in terms of spatiality and the historical cultural geography of Los Angeles. But before I go on, I'd like to share a bit of promotional footage from Jazz is Dead to give you a feeling of how they're presenting themselves. So first I'd like to discuss Jazz is Dead in terms of its attitude to genre and history, beginning with some genealogical, genealogical that is, information about the series. Events organized under the name Art Don't Sleep began in the mid-2010s and for the better part of the last 10 years has been booking concerts and events that mix up acoustic jazz sets with DJs and hip-hop crews, creating a feedback loop of influence celebrating music from the 1960s to the present. The programming of influential musical elders with younger artists who sample or otherwise remix those elders' work demonstrates Pan-African and Afrofuturistic aesthetic strategies, and this is further reflected in the mixing of hip-hop's sample culture with live instrumentation in modes of what's sometimes called alt-jazz, lo-fi hip-hop, or just beat music. 
This feedback loop demonstrates what Kristen Lilvis calls the liminality of Pan-African and Afrofuturist aesthetic strategies. Rather than a blunted hauntological space of out-of-joint nostalgia, as Mark Fisher has dubbed hypnagogic pop's dead futurism, this space of cultural expression engages productively with memory and utopic ideation, remixing the familiar as the ontologically contingent space of possibility for the new. Jazz is Dead continued this logic with programming starting in 2017 that has resulted, for example, in the 2019 Roy Ayers shows with a live band, perhaps uh, most famous for his 1976 song, Everybody Loves the Sunshine. These sold out concerts featured live DJ set openers and resulted in a record released on the Jazz is Dead imprint. Though this music is most certainly centering on black American culture manifest through music, I suggest that this focus is not exclusionary. Rather, uh, excuse me, rather than positing a universality of monolithic blackness, this cultural space of inclusivity invites plurality and a radical propensity for eclectic creolization. I take it as a starting point here Paul Gilroy's assertion that strategies in the constellation of cultural practices of the African diaspora are transcultural, transnational, and eschew racial, that is, and ethnic absolutism. Suspicious of ethnic particularism and nationalism, these favor a global coalitional politics in which anti-imperialism and anti-racism might be seen to interact, if not fuse. Ingrid Monson offers a helpful formulation of such cultural spaces whose practices engender open community with boundaries not restricted by phenotype. This approach understands culture as emerging from social practices in a process of contestation and engagement, which occurs over time, that is history. Culture as inevitably mixed and partially overlapping with other cultures around it, and cultures as not bound neatly to space or geography, but rather mediated by recording, print, and broadcast media. Culture, then, is not simply about race or ethnicity, but also about the definition and redefinition of collectivities, including races, identities, classes, ethnic groups, genders, through various kinds of social practices, uh, such as playing music, arguing about race, living in the same neighborhood, attending religious service, watching television, marriage, political activism. As such, the black culture celebrated by Jazz is Dead is historical in its scope, racially inclusive, and utopic in its vision. One can see this inclusivity in the crowds that line up for Jazz is Dead shows that evince a mixture of races, ages, and social classes, by outward appearance at least. This is further demonstrated by the Jazz is Dead record series, now working in conjunction with Impulse Records. The series engages an all-analog recording technique, uh, making new records that pair older and sometimes under-celebrated artists with younger musicians. In addition to new records with off-sampled American artists like Roy Ayers, Doug Karn, and Gary Bartz, these also include new records with Brazilian masters Arthur Verocai, Jao Donato, and Asimov. So despite its title, it's obvious that, um, yeah, this concert series is invested in musics that have been called jazz. So. What kind of work does this moniker do in refusing jazz as a genre while being simultaneously generative of a rich constellation of cultural production? My title addresses this jazz is dead, uh, excuse me, jazz is dead is not dead mess by way of the Dadaist exclamation celebrating its own paralogical being non-being. We're in that contemporary strange loop of is, is not jazz that demands we consider how we know what jazz is, who the gatekeepers are, to what authority such decisions appeal and what's at stake. Elsewhere, I've considered meaning making in jazz uh, as bigger than genre, bigger than the great man theory of jazz history populated by virtuosic jazz genius innovators, characterizing black American music rather as a virtuosic engagement with sonic archives. Meaningful acts of improvisation and the production of new music is then a kind of negotiation with novelty and established practices. And as a concert series and record label, Jazz is Dead manifests this logic by creating liminal spaces, an arc of recursion, as it were, with its live programming and records. Some historical resistance to the word jazz, as expressed by artists Duke Ellington, Max Roach, Charles Mingus, and Miles Davis, has been related to the pigeonholing that a label can do. Such a label draws a conceptual boundary around the music's possible manifestations, limiting its engagement with other influences and audiences all while constructing a monolithic cultural imaginary of what jazz is supposed to be. This is reflected in some of the recent criticism levied by Nicholas Payton in his refusal of the term, asserting jazz died in 1959. A primary goal for Jazz is Dead seems to be making explicit connections with musics that, while not jazz in terms of strict genre, are clearly part of the music's big family tree. Preparing, excuse me, primarily this means hip hop and developing strands of beat music, but also psychedelic Brazilian pop and Afrobeat. All of these uh, musics, Young argues, are related and mutually inflecting. 
And addressing this in a 2020 interview with Downbeat Magazine for the Jazz's Dead release that featured Roy Ayers, he said, hip-hop serves as a conduit to the past. If it wasn't for hip-hop, there would be a lot of music I wouldn't know. If it wasn't for hip-hop, I wonder if I would even know who Roy Ayers is. A lot of times in black culture, when we're done with something, we don't go back. And Hip-hop kind of changed that. Hip-hop is vinyl culture taken to the next level. As such, the Jazz is Dead phenomenon occasions the construction of an intermusical space that is bigger than any single genre designation might allow. The generational engagement and broad programming uh, situate its musical community in a discourse of cultural meaning making, productively complicating taxonomical efforts while reproducing emancipatory strategies, values of inclusion, self-determination, and mutual respect. So we've reached part three of my talk, the most in progress part where I'm interested in uh, considering the significance of spatiality to the Jazz is Dead phenomenon. The physical location of Jazz is Dead is a club called The Lodge Room in the Highland Park neighborhood of Los Angeles' near east side. Taking a cue from urban theorist Ed Soja that there is no unspatialized social reality, I want to add spatiality to the historicality and sociality implied by my earlier discussion of intermusicality. So as a hip eclectic music venue that programs established and up and coming artists, the Lodge Room inhabits a 100-year-old building that was originally a Masonic temple. Its renovation and repurposing has made it part of the gentrification on the strip of North Aguera Street, contributing to rising rents that are changing the overall character of the neighborhood. Composed largely of single-family dwellings for primarily working-class Hispanic and Latino families, Highland Park's main tributaries of North Aguera Street and York Boulevard are more and more aligned with shops, bars, restaurants, and clubs that draw a kind of hipster crowd. While still mixed, the gentrifying population is noticeably whiter, occupies a higher socioeconomic class, and is engaged in rehabbing and flipping properties. Clubs and gallery spaces in Highland Park have been accused by some of complicity through art washing, or the collusion of cultural expression with symbolic and economic capital, uh, to pave the way for displacement of the space's original inhabitants and ultimately cultural erasure. Jazz is Dead at the Lodge Room is not the only eclectic music series or venue in Los Angeles potentially implicated in gentrification through this process of art washing. There are several spots that program broadly, often with a focus on black American music and an openness to experimentation. These include Zebulon in Frogtown, the Echoplex in Silver Lake, and the influential beat music series Low End Theory that ran from 2006 to 2018. However, Jazz is Dead is exemplary among these for explicitly drawing lines of connection between generational legacies of mutual influence and, in, uh, excuse me, intentional intercultural engagement. It is to be hoped that this engagement with an historical social imagination is implicated not only in negative elements of gentrification. And this is because, I argue, I argue the Lodge Room is more than its material facticity and its implication in the historical urban power struggles there. It is also a place where a community of individuals can activate their historically and spatially situated personal and communal imaginations. Soja argues that the spatially situated interactions of relevant historicality and sociality may productively activate a community's fictive capacities, activating real and imagined negotiations therein, and instantiating a rebalancing act that might uh, disrupt limitations of previous local epistemological and ontological assumptions. As what Soja would call a third space, Jazz is Dead might act as a node for heuristic, iterative cultural expression significant for its ability to augment social realities. In conclusion, then, I suggest that by programming small group jazz, funk, samba, hip-hop, experimental beat music, and more, Jazz is Dead is by accident or design engaged in the sonic and spatialized curation of a community that models those musical interspaces, mixing audiences of varied histories of taste, race, and socioeconomic background, sometimes separated by those very differences. Its vivifying, symbolically rich space transcends genre and is a testimony to music's relationship to memory, representation, and resistance. Thank you, and I look forward to our conversation.